Vorkuta is the fastest dying city in Russia. This is a prime example of what happens to Soviet monotowns if they lack everything apart from a so-called city-forming enterprise. In just 30 years, Vorkuta has lost over half its population. At one point, it was the third largest city beyond the Arctic Circle, but today, it is empty. Nobody knows how many people live here. The official statistics don't reflect reality, as many locals have left Vorkuta long ago, but they're still registered here. A lot of workers' settlements in the city's suburbs remain abandoned. Which leads to the question, is Vorkuta even worth saving? Is it worth supporting the people that have stayed here, or is it best to just let the city die in peace? It looks like they spared no expenses when they built this place. You can see rich decor. This is a typical example of Stalinist architecture. What's important here is that the houses that aren't abandoned, the ones that are falling apart, they are still there. This is a two-story house. It looks pretty sturdy and normal. Doesn't seem crooked. Getting to Vorkuta isn't easy. Trains from Moscow take almost two days, there are no regular flights, and people often get stuck here for several days due to bad weather. I came here at the end of September to see the city before the snow and winter nights engulf it until spring. The first things you see in Vorkuta are beat-up roads, gray surroundings, and a pedestal with an old Soviet Mi-4 helicopter with Aeroflot written on the side. Vorkuta is 150 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, on the edge of Russia's permafrost boundary. The climate here is harsh, cold, and humid, while the skies are always cloudy and gray. These harsh conditions had been preventing anyone from settling here until the Soviets came to power. The Russian government discovered coal deposits here back in the 19th century, so the industrial invasion of the Arctic Circle was practically predetermined. In 1938, Soviet secret police, or the NKVD, found that Vorkutlok, which quickly became one of the largest camps in the Gulag system. Vorkuta owes its existence to the camp's prisoner slaves, who were forced into the coal mines. In 1932, the government ordered to build a mine here. Not a town, a mine. Imagine, you're 800 kilometers away, far from here, and you're assigned to develop a resource that's practically untapped at that point, like oil, gas, or even coal. They started building a narrow-gauge railroad here at the end of 1933. It took 145 days to build, from the end of 1933 to 1934. It was ready by the end of 34. this little narrow railroad. The track was 744 millimeters wide, with small, toy-like steam locomotives and eight platforms that held as much coal as one freight car carries nowadays. How did people end up here? How could they come here? How were they transported here? Only by river. Up the Pechora and the Usai, and the remaining 64 kilometers up the Vorkuta River. To get to this place from Moscow, that took two and a half to three months. For the first 30 years, the city and the mines were built exclusively by prisoners, many of whom died. These are my numbers. I haven't seen them published anywhere yet. For some reason, the data on the camps remains a state secret to this day. Why the hell it has to remain a secret, I don't know. The public got a glimpse of it after the fall of the Soviet Union. The archives were finally opened in the 1990s, and people got to take a look. I managed to find out that the fatality rate of the prisoners that came through Vorkutlog was 13%. That's more than 200,000 people. More than 200,000. They died not so much of hunger. It was hard and difficult during the war years, of course. But from injuries they sustained while working in the mines. Everything was done manually. People went up and down on foot. Many fell sick, but many died because they got injured in the mines. 
After the Gulag was shut down in 1960, the question arose, what to do next? That's when the Soviet government decided to offer benefits and higher pay to people working in the far north. Workers poured into Vorkuta over the next three decades. One could make a very good living thanks to the so-called northern or polar bonuses. I finished school and studied here, and left for Leningrad in 1989, as it was known back then, and the contrast between the two cities was huge. Vorkuta was great, there were no food shortages, public transport ran on time, everything was neat and tidy and civilized. Leningrad, on the other hand, was abandoned, filthy, and downright miserable. There was a massive contrast between the two. I remember that people got really long vacations here. Everyone had three months off, including my parents. We went traveling across the country. Vorkuta always looked better. It was much more civilized and intelligent when compared to other Soviet cities. It was just really, really good here. Vorkuta was doing well right up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. The country's steel mills ground to a halt and demand for coal fell sharply. Mines began closing one after the other. Out of the 13 coal mines in Vorkuta that Russia inherited from the USSR, only four have survived to this day. Left without work, people headed south. This is what the dying city looks like today. All that's left of the oasis it used to be. Like in many other northern cities, people here try and uh, to, to jazz up the architecture with these bright colors by painting ordinary Soviet panel uh, apartment blocks. Cities with good roads are much better than those with bright buildings, if you ask me. They should have spent that money on road repairs. Then, maybe Vorkuta would be more fun. I need to watch what I'm saying here. I'm used to calling these five-story buildings when, in fact, they're actually three or four stories high. I mean, talk about architectural diversity. I mean, what's actually nice here is that a lot of Soviet architecture remains unchanged. The neon signs, the, the street signs, the, the bas reliefs on the buildings, they're all still here. Here's a Soviet-era vertical neon sign that says, Opticians. You can find this at Gagarin Street 10, and the sign's in pretty good shape. This is still an optical store, and its owners have lined the exterior with siding and put up a new printed-out sign. The new sign's clearly falling apart, while the beautiful Soviet one is firmly in its place. Instead of restoring and repairing the old sign to make it look good, they print it out and put up this piece of junk. You can clearly see the difference in the two approaches, how people used to do things and how they do them now. I wonder what this used to be. Everything's abandoned. This is abandoned. This is abandoned too. It would be strange to expect good roads in a place where everything's abandoned. I really want to say something nice about Vorkuta. I, I, I like that some streets, they, they don't have lampposts, but they have these lamps instead. They're all leftovers from the Soviet period. This all reminds me of a movie set. Like, if you were at a movie studio and saw set decorations that made it seem like you were in London, this could be a set of a typical Soviet town. You turn here, and that's where the set ends. There's nothing beyond that. And we're back to our Soviet town film set. Uh, streets and avenues, there's a pompous building in the distance over there along with a monument to somebody. Check this out though. This is an old traffic light. It's not LED. You won't be able to find this in Moscow anymore. This is a really old, authentic traffic light. Uh, this street and these buildings date back to the 1950s. They were built by Gulag prisoners, and, so they say, German POWs. You can look at the architecture and see that 70 years have gone by. And these buildings, they're still standing. They're sturdy. And by today's standards, if these houses were restored and you put in modern communications and utilities and all the rest of it, this would be pretty decent real estate. You can clearly see here how they built houses at the beginning of the 1950s, right after World War II, and how they build bus stops today. These modern bus stops look like garbage containers. This is what garbage dumps usually look like. The bins go in containers made out of roofing sheets. 
Many homes are abandoned, but some aren't. A few apartments here are still occupied, but the majority are abandoned, and people are leaving. The walls are already cracking here, but there are still people living inside. This is what it looks like from the backyard. It's kind of creepy walking around here. You look at all these buildings, this rich 1950s architecture, the stucco, and everything else. Uh, on one hand, it's delightful, but on the other hand, it's, it's awfully sad. It's sad to see all this dying away. This is Vorkuta's old TV center, an old Soviet building that's now abandoned, built in 1958. Pretty affluent for these parts. As you can see, they didn't spare any money on infrastructure here in the 1950s and 60s to at least somehow please the people that worked in these difficult conditions. I wonder what young people do here. They get drunk. They get drunk? So there's not much entertainment here besides alcohol. The artist that was commissioned to make that sign agonized for a long time. He didn't have any ideas. He struggled and struggled. And then he looked at his windowsill and saw a bottle of vodka. That's the shape that he decided to use for the sign. Look at this, guys. Even in Vorkuta, a city with no life, joy, or happiness, we see these fences. Even here, we see ugly fencing all over the place. This won't stop us from crossing the road because there's no other crossing to be seen. There aren't even any cars here, and there are still fences. Abandoned buildings, shrubs, thickets, uh, an old Soviet mosaic, and oh, a new fence. Who comes up with this stuff? Our government isn't capable of doing anything else besides putting up these shitty fences. They'll start putting up these fences in hell, between the cauldrons. <laughs> it's horrible. Here we see everyone's favorite five-story buildings. Many still have the original balconies that are made out of wood. Ooh, look at that kiosk. That's out of the 90s. Vorkuta is like a side effect of Soviet ambition. It used to be a prosperous industrial city. Now it's just a bunch of abandoned panel buildings and the occasional architectural reminder of past glory. Today's Vorkuta looks more like the set of a post-apocalyptic film.